So let's start. So I would like to welcome you to the Abend Family Lecture. And um, before I introduce our lecturer for this evening, I would like to bring a couple of things to your attention. And um, we actually reinstated the QR code again for you, the same as we did last academic year. This time it will not show up at the door. This time it will show up at the screen after the lecture. So when you are, when you, when we're all done with the lecture, you can take your exactly. You can take your iPhone, and you can just take a snapshot and. So you're all good to go. So this is for those of you who would like to actually participate in the continued education program provided by the AIA. So please download the QR code um, with your smartphone um, after, after lecture from the screen that's gonna be displayed here. So um, I also would like to um, bring to your attention, we have um, another lecture coming um, on November 18th, that's French 2D from Boston, Massachusetts. And um, they're coming November 18th, right? Okay, good. So, but let's go back to September 30th. So, and for that, I would like to introduce to you Rafi Siegel. And Rafi is a, a practicing architect and associate professor of architecture and urbanism at, at MIT, where he directs the Master of Science in Architecture and Urbanism program and the MIT Future Urban Collectives. This is a design research lab with focus on how physical and digital strategies in architecture Urbanism can, and urbanism can support cohabitation, co-production, and coexistence. And following this line of thinking, um, his design work and research revolves around how mutualism and collectivity can actually impact the design of buildings and cities across architectural, urban, and regional scales. Which means, in other words, the very place a building is actually situated in um, has an impact and responsibility towards a civic value across its neighborhoods and the larger urban context. Rafi's entry into professional practice took shape under the mentorship of Sui Hecker. And Sui Hecker um, is actually really well known. I hope you all know him. And um, Rafi um, started working with him during his last year of his architecture studies at the Technikon in Tel Aviv. Um, and eventually transforming into working together and, and collaborating on the Palmach History Museum, which they completed together in 1999. Um, other key projects of Rafi's work include the Ashdat Museum of Art, of Art in Israel, the Kikum Peace Museum and War Archive in Uganda, Africa, and the winning proposal for the National Library of Israel in, in Jerusalem. Um, he also developed an affordable housing prototype which I think you all should check out, that the Rwanda Housing Authority implemented to provide housing for rural areas in Africa. And his most current work includes Care House, and this is located in Baltimore, the first intergenerational care-based and co-housing project in the United States, which he founded together with the artist, with the artist Marisa Moran Jan and the developer Ernst Valerie. Rafi is also the author and co-author of various publications, and I'm gonna mention only a couple of them, not all of them. And the most recent one, uh, the most recent publication named Design and Solidarity, which he co-authored with Marisa Moran-Jan. Then there is Space Pact, the architecture of Alfred Neumann. Then In Search of the Public, Notes on the Contemporary American City, and Cities of Dispersal, among many other publications he was part of. His work has also been widely published in the United States and across the world. And I'm gonna mention only a couple names here. So there's Storefront for Architecture, which you probably all know. Then there's Kunstwerk Berlin, Germany, Witte de Witt in Rot Rotterdam, Netherlands. There's MoMA New York, the Hong Kong Shenzhen Urbanism Biennale, and the Architecture Venice Biennale. So Rafi, we're super excited you're here. So, and we're really looking forward to um, hear about the work that you have generated over the years practicing architecture while conducting your research towards designing for the collective. Welcome. Uh, uh, let's, let's try and dim the lights as much as possible. No, no need to take notes. Um, can we do a little bit more? Less of it, less light. Great. I, I have light coming from here, so. So I'll leave this uh, wonderful campus. I'm gonna take you on a, on a small journey to another part of, of the world. We get there by boat, by ferry. Uh, we leave Greece, the mainland, and we start moving around the Aegean uh, with the kind of wildlife and the islands and the territories and the coming flow 
closer as you're moving away, right? Uh, in sunrise, sunset, these are trips that take a while. But eventually, we arrive at a port. Uh, this is on the island of Andos, which is, uh, is a Cycladic island. And there is a long history. Uh, you would think that this is landscape, but this is all human made uh, landscape. Uh, on the way, we might stop for a bite, a restaurant with tables and a light and food, obviously. And with a client, possibly, we sketch something out. We plan that in advance. It's not that uh, spontaneous, you know. Do you need a microphone? I need a microphone? Yes. Yeah. It's for a recording. It's for the recording. Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not going to start over. Can you hear me now? Is this better? Yes. Oh, all right. Uh, you know, and after a nice meal, you want to take a swim, of course. Uh, there's traffic on this island, a lot of uh, traffic issues. Uh, eventually, we, we go to the other side, we reach a bay. This place is called Corthy Bay. There's a village. Uh, there's also a site marked, marked up there, nothing yet on it. Um, it's a small village, but active. And the site is, is really fantastic, um, has an incredible view. Uh, I visit the site, well, this is many, many years ago. Uh, one side you see the, the ocean, and the other side you see the valley, right? I bring friends over. I said, hey, you know, you want to buy, <laughs> buy this land, maybe build something here? Uh, they're not convinced. One, one, one guy is, actually, <laughs> a family. I, you know, I start designing this. I cannot but think of Delphi and how the Greeks approached uh, a slope. You never walk straight. You always walk diagonal. This is how you traverse the mountain. And there's always stairs. And, and therefore, you begin to curate a passage, a movement, right? And steps are key. Uh, not just to get from one point to the other, but the way that you move through the landscape. That is an architectural idea, right? That's, an, uh, that's a kind of an architectural principle, maybe. And these steps or this kind of movement in between where building, space, landscape all kind of merge. But at the same time, uh, the island, you know, buildings are very distinct. They're just like uh, boxes, objects kind of thrown into the landscape. Not something we don't know from other practices or art, right? The frame. Not only the box, but the frame that is created, right? And there is, uh, we, we know the the promenade, uh, architecture, the, the movement through space, the framing of, of space. And this is the experience of, uh, for me in Greece, this outside, inside, in, out, the constant kind of movement that you, you see through the space, out into the space, and so forth. I'm lucky to have a nice working space on this island. And by the way, this is really important. Don't work in basements or in small, shabby rooms find a really nice place to work. Uh, it, it impacts what we do. Yeah? So, so initially, sketches start by this line of movement, how you move through the mountain. And along that line of movement, maybe a few rooms can kind of cling onto. Uh, and then models, you know, from sketches to models, topography, placing those kind of boxes to follow that path. Maybe they inter. inter uh, act in a way, or they, they are superimposed, but it's really this kind of lines of movement that begin to guide the, the design, as you can see here. Inside, outside, outside, in, and along that, that path, uh, you, you're kind of creating an experience from various views that you capture, because the landscape is really so majestic. Architecture is just in service of an experience. The space is there. We just try and hold it, you know, for a moment. And then construction starts. Uh, it's five houses. Uh, you see one, two, three, four here. The other one is on the other side. We haven't started that yet. Um, and these boxes some kind, somehow work with the landscape, but are also disconnected from it. So in a way, they're both, they sit there, obviously. They're not that light, but they want to, present a condition where you know, something is allowing them to be there, which is coming from, from the landscape. Um, the interiors are very simple, uh, 
concrete. This contractor is, just has a concrete plant on the island. So he loves to do concrete, and he takes pride in the concrete. Uh, and white, of course, you're in Greece. You cannot not do white. You know? um, but you, you begin to get a sense of the, the back and forth. Well, it's a very simple project. Um, and there is no simple project in architecture, actually. <laughs> Uh, simple, yes, but everything takes so, so much time and so much work. But on the side and through the kind of the process, we discover things. You know, you get an overview of the walls, which have been there for centuries, these terraces. And there are different kinds of interventions. You could put a stair. You could put a terrace. You could recreate. You can continue some of these walls. You can interpret these walls in different ways. You can allow these boxes to sit. All the stone is from the site. Uh, this is amazing. The site produces the stone. But then you leave parts empty, right? Because in a way, that framing, that view, is really what, what kind of captured my attention from the start. This is a house for two sisters. Uh, one sister lives here, and one sister lives here. And each has a courtyard, and they meet. There's a door here that they fight. They could close the door. But otherwise, they could share. And then, you know, this sister could have her kids here. This sister could have her kids over there. Uh, but these two kind of uh, are combined, but they're also separate. Uh, this is from a few weeks ago. You see the existing stone wall to the point where, and this was really a, a lot of work to get, to get them to understand, the, the workers, that we don't want to have nice, clean, new walls. We want to keep it rough. And no matter how much I sketch it out and was there on site, it kind of had to be there to show, hey, just do this and, you know, less concrete. Just let the, let the stones just sit. They're heavy, you know. And this is the kind of discussions that I could never foresee. Uh, this is another house for, for another family. She's a a dancer that does therapy. Uh, they have, she has a studio underneath here. But you, you see that it's one house, but it's broken up. Oh, you have the bedroom here, outdoor space, outdoor uh, kind of storage, outdoor. So, you know, we're, we're in Greece, the climate allows it. Uh, you know, half the spaces are outdoors, really. They're not, not interior. Uh, and, and this one kind of sits on top and climbs down the mountain. And it's under construction. The others are more. So, there is a thinking here which is more rationalizing this kind of system of doing different houses but still related. So a kind of, um, let's say, I wouldn't say compound, but a kind of small mini village emerges, yeah? which is intentional. I'll talk about that. Now, the various kinds of walls, uh, and you really can't waste time kind of trying even to uh, draft this digitally, you know, just the it, it won't convey even that this you do, you do very quickly, but you capture what what the intentions are, you know, and and we have to understand that always. Ideally, yes, we make a plan, uh, and then someone builds by that plan. But as a, a former 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 a professor of mine said, um, the the best plans are actually done after the building is built. Uh, yeah, here's our contractor. And, and you see that the stone and the outside kind of feel goes into the interior um, and creates also oh, as much as possible. If the walls can contain, you know, furniture, then obviously, again, in this setting, um, it's ideal. And what are these houses really for? Uh, and, and we call them gathering homes. There are five families. Some related, the sisters and uh, a cousin and two other friends. And they're all scattered in different parts of the world. And this is where uh, they, they like to meet and where they also would like their children to meet uh, in the future. So it's, it's, it's a modest project, really. The spaces are not big. The houses are really not big. Um, but it has, it has a purpose that, that goes beyond, you know, uh, just a second home or vacation home. It's really that space of gathering that people come together. And we ourselves, my family uh, is also kind of scattered. Kids are here, sister is there, you know. 
And so we had this tradition of, of coming together um, and meeting. And that, that really has value because, I mean, also in, in this country, you know, once you kind of scatter, how, how many times do you get to see your kids? Uh, you know, when they're young, you just carry them on vacation. But when they become adults, you know, everyone has their own plans and so forth. So this is kind of the idea. Um, now it's kind of gained more meaning uh, in a way with people wanting to spend here more time <laughs> once the houses are built. Um, but it goes back to, to a bigger question about who we're designing for and the different kinds of households, let's say, or the different kinds of social structures. And, you know, architecture is always behind uh, because social structures and, and the types of families that we have change much quicker than the, than the buildings we, we design. And we kind of have this habit of, right, of just working with, with existing paradigms. Uh, I mean, you don't know this, but in a very kind of less than a generation, this is, this is a radical change for architecture, right? We're moving away from kind of the nuclear white family to even way beyond that kind of what does that mean? What does that mean for housing? Uh, I, I like this example from of a film a long ago. You have the three generation immigrant Asian family, and then you have the old loner, right? And, but completely different households, but they live in exactly the same suburban house. Right? So now, yes, in Greece, maybe you know, on an island you could do stuff, but we have another island here, the island of Manhattan, and housing here is also an issue. So a different, uh, completely different setting, but a similar design process that starts with observation. And this is something I have to say is a key and not, and, and I cannot stress enough. Observing, uh, recording, um, you know, the, the process of synthesis of ideas and observations happens in, in the creative mind, but, but, um, but the reading of the territory or the context, whether it's visible, like you saw in Greece, or whether it's invisible, like all these office buildings that have empty space in them. One of them built in the 60s uh, by SOM, uh, by chance. Uh, this is built in a time that energy is basically free. Uh, but to take a single-use office building like that today and refurbish it to today's standards is, is too costly. And no one wants an old office building, right? So what do you do with it? And this was a commission from, uh, from the... Um, uh, New York uh, Housing uh, Council to rethink uh, empty office space in New York. And this is like 10 years ago. So what we did, and I worked on this with Sam Allen, we took the idea of the New York City block, which is fantastic, because in every block you have everything, right? Multi-scale, multi-program, and kind of flipped it. And uh, tectonically, let's say, or structurally, what we found is the existing uh, floor to floor in these old buildings was very high. So you could easily take two floors, right, and turn them into three residential. But then the added space you're getting, you don't just give to the developer. You create an open garden in the back, which in itself, yeah, that's, that's cool. But then how do you operate on the scale of the entire building in a way that's coherent? What happens in the plan? You know, section, okay, resolved. But the plan, you know, the floor plan of an office is too deep for housing, right? So you put housing on the edges, right, where they get light, and then in, in the deeper part of the floor plate, you have other programs, shared programs. So an architectural move leads to a program, a programmatic move, not always the other way around, right? You would think program leads to, to form, but a certain architecture move could, could begin to make you think about form. And then various kind of units we can play with, uh, you know, for commuters, for uh, families, et cetera, becomes a kind of Tetris of units, et cetera, and then kind of builds, builds up a facade. And then the, the big move. The big move is connecting all those cutouts, all those voids of gardens into a single, into a single collective, operation, yeah? And that, uh, 
then a kind of a vertical spiraling park that hits the ground level, right, through this kind of series of spaces, uh, and, and picks up that, that space and kind of you can walk around the building through it. And this is not uncommon to things that are happening in cities now uh, that are becoming greener. You know, cities in history did not used to have green space in them. This is a relatively new idea. But what we are seeing now more and more, old infrastructure is becoming green and cities are becoming more pedestrianized, right? Broadway, New York City is already you know, like completely closed for pedestrians. This is also a relatively recent move. And so we have the initial idea of this project was for the housing council to have a few architects do designs and then pair them with developers and, and under a kind of a Bloomberg initiative at that time get one built. Obviously, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't get this. A uh, developer wouldn't, didn't want to do anything like this. Uh, but I found it interesting as an urban project, right? Because every floor now becomes uh, its own like land use map, different kind of programs, right? So the, the plan really is an unfolded facade, which becomes your, your program, right? And then it folds back on itself and creates that move. And then, uh, you know, the podium kind of gave us that, that freedom to play around with these cubicles. And when this was presented in New York, uh, uh, there was a piece in the Times, and it said, oh, this, this guy is doing an, an urban kibbutz. You know, oh, there's all kind of individual rooms, and all, which, you know, maybe. We played around with that. We didn't get to build it there. Uh, I did do a, an editing studio, and I played around with these kind of cubes that wasn't the intention, but it wasn't far from the truth because really I was interested very much in this idea of a kibbutz, of a collective community or a collective housing. Uh, and part of that later was brought into MIT uh, through this lab that, that I uh, direct. It's a group, it's sometimes it, uh, we, we run uh, classes along themes that are connected with the research group. Other, in other times, uh, we engage some projects, I'll show you one of them. Uh, and, and the core idea is to begin to question the divide between private and, and public as a single binary divide. And to say, imagine that there is a space of various gradients or various conditions between the, the private and public, various kind of collective conditions. One of these projects uh, uh, took place in Rwanda uh, and there were certain conditions that I have to explain that it was an educational project, but it was also a project that involved uh, students from the University of Rwanda and the Rwanda Housing Authority. So this is an MIT project that I led with students to build a prototype for an affordable house. And we didn't want to come in, oh, what do we know, right? Uh, but we realized that our presence there, MIT, I say, was more to allow different agencies to talk to each other through us. And so, for example, um, this group, uh, Scott Consulting, the Swiss company that sets up brick factories in Rwanda. But the, the housing authority, the government, wasn't in relationship with them, so we brokered that relationship through the process of teaching students to build with brick. Students, uh, MIT, University of Rwanda students, and the villagers that were building a house for their future neighbor. Now, many of the houses are built like this, mud brick, and you know, after some heavy rains, this house slides, and then the government took the initiative and did brick housing, but the quality of brick was very low, uh, and you see the kind of the layout here. This is really uh, this is awful, right? I mean, where is the open spaces like in the bars and it feels so, so clamped and, uh, and you know, talk about why cheap brick is expensive because when you use cheap brick, it's, it's not straight and you need so much mortar and actually mortar. Cement is way more expensive than brick. You know, brick comes from, uh, from just clay of the land. So we said, okay, let's try something else. Uh, and this is where we, we started. Uh, you see the MIT students, well, you see they're kind of mixed with masons that taught them how to work with brick. And there are a lot of debates and questions and engineers came and 
we worked in the day on site at night, you know, where we could have Wi-Fi and did some brick patterns. And, uh, you know, some were skeptical here about this process. Let's see if this runs. Okay, there's a short video here. Is it? Oh, here we go. Time lapse. So a lot of people are involved, right? Moving in and out uh, throughout the whole, but what you see really, nothing really happens on site. <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere. I mean, that's, it's not really the point. The point is that it's a collective project and through this, it, it, literally nothing happens, you know, maybe one row of bricks, but, but it's the discussion, it's the conversation, it's figuring out, okay, uh, what we do here, what we, it's, it's the learning, it's, it's learning as you make. I think, you know, for students, it's an incredible experience, yeah? Eventually, we came up with a design that everyone agreed on, uh, and I was tasked to convince the head of the um, Rwanda Housing Authority that this is actually a good idea, and it saves money because we're using less brick. <laughs> He's absolutely not convinced. Uh, but eventually, we build a house. Uh, and it's $1,000 cheaper than what they built, and it's bigger because it takes the entire site as a single project. It doesn't say site, house, leftover. It says the open space is inside the house, right? And it's one open space here and one open space there. It's a really small house. It's uh, less than 800 square feet. But this open space is to be interpreted. What is it? It can be a shop. It can be a porch, it could be a hangout for a family, it could be another room, whatever, whatever they want it to be. Uh, it's, it's kind of open to interpretation. It's some, and you know, uh, this is one of the, the roads that this village is going, to, uh, is going to use, so it's kind of the public facing side. And then in the back, water is collected, uh, toilets, uh, kitchen, all that kind of on the back side. This is part of a larger uh, urban planning effort to understand the entire area. And this is a village outside Kigali, the main city, about half an hour away, where the, the key ideas is, uh, and this is coming as an initiative of the government, to invest in villages, in the infrastructure, and in social amenities and services in order to keep, uh, to, to allow people in the rural lands to have a better life. And these ideas are coming from what, what, can, what can I do from uh, ideas that I've researched and worked on in the kibbutz context of collective, collective programs that are shared by, by the village. And it's kind of easy to do it in this context because you know village is a smaller kind of social group. So whether it's uh, shared cow sheds and, and, and shared um, uh, health, health center uh, or daycare, et cetera. So that's the logic that, that's been that's guided this kind of urban, urban plan and other cases of other kibbutz settlements, which I, I won't talk about today, which I, I've designed, uh, obviously have, have gone through various iterations of, of this kind of communal, communal living. My, my work in Israel um, really began uh, a long time ago with, with Svi Hecker, uh, which right out of school I, I went to study um, to uh, first uh, work at, at his office. Uh, and it was a very personal uh, kind of way into architecture because basically he's an architect that I wanted to work with. Um, and then I discovered much later that actually he experienced the same. He was a pupil of an architect known as Alfred Neumann, uh, which you know, was mentioned. And Neumann was a student uh, of uh, Auguste Perret. And you know, things as uh, I worked with Hecker for, for almost 10 years uh, very closely, I realized later actually these ideas or this approach didn't come only from him, but it came from Neumann through him, right? Uh, so there is a kind of uh, unwritten <laughs> passage of attitude, let's say. And, and Neumann was a contemporary of Le Corbusier and he, he developed this um, kind of theory of space. And eventually with Hecker and another collaborator, they built a few projects in the 60s, which were really radical. So some, some of these ideas I had or understandings without really knowing 
where they came from. They only kind of later, when I did uh, research and I published this book, um, then I kind of understood them more in depth. One of the projects that really we worked on, or the primary project that I worked on, is a history museum in Tel Aviv. And Tel Aviv is designed as a garden city. And this is a northern part of the, of the city. And it's right off the, the campus. And the campus, uh, you know, like many, many campuses, has the same approach to building. There is green space. And we kind of throw in buildings as objects. And they're kind of connected by paths. Uh, so this history museum. Uh, was at the edge of the campus, but we kind of avoided that approach. And uh, given a site that has trees in the middle rather than was the problem, if the trees are in the middle, you want to keep them, what we did actually is we carved around the trees and built a building around the trees. Uh, and, and this is really where uh, the, the, the power of, and geometry governs all of that, the power of the inner space of an inner courtyard uh, as something that has nature uh, really kind of um, stuck with me in a way. As imagine all this effort in, into architecture to capture a space that was there, but you give it new life. Yeah? So when I, I did the design for the uh, National uh, the Library of Israel in Jerusalem, uh, which w we won first prize on this project. Uh, the same kind of uh, approach stayed with me. And obviously, there are questions, general questions, about the future of the library, right? From it being uh, like a temple guarded by lions uh, to the whole idea of knowledge. Where is knowledge? You know, where is knowledge today? You know, these two uh, objects are. 4,000 years apart, but they're very similar. They're very similar in form. They both are designed for the, for the hand. Uh, and they carry knowledge. But knowledge is not written in stone or carved in stone. It's in the cloud. So a library is really not a container of knowledge. It's more an access to it. And then the question, well, who has access to that knowledge? And how do you do that in a city like Jerusalem, which is so contested and divided and, and conflicted? And obviously, the urban context played a, an enormous role here. And if um, you do a cross-section through Jerusalem, you see the old city over here, a 19th century city, and what we can call the 20th century city of you know, objects kind of scattered. Um, the old city, right? The walls, you leave the walls. You go into the kind of the 19th century city where you see a bit of green here and there, right? And then you move on to this zone, this area, that has government buildings and the parliament and other. Uh, and all this is in context of work that I did almost 20 years ago, which looked at planning and architecture in Israel in a very critical way and said, you know, that uh, the occupation of the West Bank is really a civilian project, not so much an army project. And I worked on this with the Al Weizmann, and we were very critical. We did an exhibition and a publication, which was uh, censored, banned, but basically we we began mapping and showing the the complex uh, conditions uh, of this territorial conflict and how it's played out in in the territory of the West Bank around Jerusalem. And what is uh, is really uh, fascinating uh, fascinating is maybe not the right word, but um, disturbing at the same time is that Jerusalem is a city of barriers. Barriers that are created by architects, oh well, by architecture and planners, right? by architects and planners, by urban planning and by architecture. Barrier is not only a fence you, you, you kind of construct, but it's walls and it's kind of walls made of housing. Yes, obviously there are real concrete walls as well, but it's a city that is constantly divided vertically. It's segregated. So it's, it's, a, it's a city of continuous zones of control that are all created by these, by these barriers. So obviously, when, when looking at a site like this, with, with that understanding or with that, let's say, um, critique, OK, time, I'm OK with time. At this point, uh, when I decided to enter the competition, uh, because it's um, 
I thought it's a very interesting brief and a unique opportunity to, to explore that. But at the same time, the design, and we can talk about that in more detail, but there is an opportunity, uh, and I would even say that all the design that we do is to some degree critical. Uh, how much we are aware of it is another question, but it is an opportunity to use design or to understand architecture as a critical act in the way that we shape something. So for example, knowing that Jerusalem is a city of barriers, of vertical divisions, uh, can we make a building or can we propose a building that has absolutely no barriers and maximizes a seamless horizontal condition? as in this case, which started with just the entire side. And ideally, if you can access the entire side uh, seamlessly, then, then there is a project worth investigating in this context for me. And this is how it started with a line, but a line that breaks into two, and one becomes the interior and one becomes the roof. And both are accessible, right? Both can interact. Uh, and so it's a, it's a project that's governed by the single section, really, the single longitude section, you see. You enter from the low part and gradually as you enter in, you know, spaces kind of um, expose themselves, right, or develop in, in the kind of the continuous horizontal movement. And the roof becomes that other space that you access, uh, have access to. And, and uh, yes, there are landscape connotations, you know, this is a city that's built on mountains, terraces, there's human-made terraces, there are, there are uh, terraces, uh, there are steps, there's terraces in the landscape everywhere, right? And there's also carving. Uh, this is a former project, I, no, I'm kidding, I wish. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, you, you, light and air also has to be brought into a building. What can we do? We're human. Uh, and this kind of development, and you see maybe before from the Hecker project I showed you, the geometry, the insistent on some rigor, and geometry as a kind of way to, to divide space and, and organize space, yeah. And so there is a continuous pattern here that repeats itself. So is it subtractive? Is it additive? It is a movement. It is a movement in the landscape. It is a project that tries to merge with the landscape, very different from the architecture you saw of Jerusalem, right? And it has connotations, uh, and it's also, uh, it has, you know, the up and down, like the city itself, you're either under it or you're above it. There's, you know, nowhere else to go, really. This is one of the cities that you, you leave either down or up, who knows, depending what you believe. Uh, and so the reading room also has, and all the spaces along has that up and down uh, up and down, and then programmatically, which was actually quite radical for, for them to accept, is that it's open. The whole building is open. The, the first part um, is open 24-7. The second part is just culture, exhibition space, open to the public. Only the third kind of space, or the third courtyard, is a reading room, and then the fourth is the music center. And they're all accessible, so the library is this kind of closed card access, is, is, is not, not the case, it's not the typology. You know, it's a different type. It's really more of a mini city in a way, right? As the plan you see is completely open, what creates the space or creates a kind of division is the cross sections, that, that they completely change as you move from one to the other to that and so forth. And it's all part of the same building, but completely different, yeah, some renders. I'll uh, end with this last project, which has been preoccupying me for a few years, and I think has a lot of, uh, of great, uh, of a really important message for, for where we live now, I mean, for, for this country. Uh, and it also relates to research and writings that, that we did in, in this book, uh, and it's Care House. And Care House um, is a very simple idea. It's basically a single residential building where elders and caregivers live, meaning elders have their own independent apartments and their caregivers have their own independent apartments. And there are a series of shared spaces around which care takes place or around which a community can be formed. 
a very, very simple idea, and it relates to many problems that we have here. Not only do we have a care crisis, and you know, anyone I bet in this room has some personal uh, understanding of, of what, it, what it means to, or within the family, to deal with care, and the idea that there's just simply not enough hands to go around. There are not enough people, and the caregivers that we have, uh, there's an extremely high turnover. Uh, there are low wages, they can't afford the rent. Often, uh, single parents, they commute hours to give care and leave their, you know, their kid behind. And, and with that, not only is it a human problem of, of caregivers and elders, it's also a health issue of isolation, which is becoming acknowledged more and more as a serious health problem. So the social determinants of health, and, and we say social determinants, immediately you know that there's an architectural project here. Uh, so, you know, this is a project that I'm not only a designer, but I also found it, and uh, we're lucky enough to, to work with, with uh, an artist filmmaker, Marissa Maranyan, on, on this, who's been working with domestic workers for over a decade, and a developer who has some uh, social awareness and interest to do a social project, Ernst Valerie from, from Baltimore. And how does, uh, this slide is a bit off, but how does Care House work? Basically, elders pay rent and pay a salary. The salary goes to the caregivers, and the caregivers get also subsidized rent. The first project that just got permitted and is going into construction this fall uh, is in Baltimore. And it's located in you know one of the uh, underserved neighborhoods in Baltimore, and that's what also intentional for us. Uh, but it's one of the kind of connectors between East Baltimore and West Baltimore. And so the the site occupies a corner. It's a five-story building with 21 units, and the ratio is around one to five, one to six. Yeah. So we have around uh, 16, and so. 17 uh, elders, three to four caregivers, and a site manager. And the design is really organized. Well, one is, you know, to, to design a building for older adults that doesn't look like a building for, <laughs> for older adults. Obviously, so design has a role here in expressing, or I would say, celebrating old age. Yeah? And then the plan organized kind of in a U shape with a kind of alley in the back, uh, creates this uh, kind of extensive almost windows or extensive kind of conditions of interaction with the street and the corner. And so the urban uh, power of, of the building is by activating also this, this corner and creating a, a commercial space uh, on the ground level and, and so forth. So uh, sketches is kind of how do you develop this and create enough diversity uh, in the units to make it not this kind of cookie cutter or an institutional feel. And if you visited, uh, whether it's assisted living or nursing homes, you know that they always feel so institutional. Who, who would want to live there, you know? And so to try and use design to make, to make an appeal uh, to that. And this is not something that we did on our own, but we set up a whole process of co-design sessions with, with nurses, with doctors, with uh, older and disabled adults with caregivers, right? And developed a plan that uh, you see in pink has this central shared space, but, uh, and it kind of sets back. So every floor has a different shared uh, space, uh, which has a different program, whether it's a lounge, whether it's a garden, whether it's a reading room or a kitchen. And so it all really comes together in a section that you see the pink is the shared space around which the units are, are organized. Uh, but it's also a space of light, a space that always has access to the outdoor. And, you know, in, in COVID times, of course, this kind of people realize how valuable that is to have that access to the outdoor, to the garden, and so forth. And, and this is a model that um, we developed on this Baltimore site, but we're now actually working on three or four others in, in different cities in the programming of of it. So I'm touching only on the architecture, but the whole financial model, the whole programmatic model is that we don't come in alone, but we form partnerships with an art institute that sends an artist once every two weeks to do a workshop 
or a chef that comes in and does kind of nutrition. Uh, so, and you know, obviously a care provider that, that uh, manages the caregivers. So it's really a complex, uh, it's a complex undertaking to make this work. When, when we present a new typology, and it is a kind of new typology, then you know, people ask, well, how do we use it? You know, how do we live? What, you know, who does the dishes? You know, there's a very various and uh, uh, sometimes very mundane questions that come up whenever we just even slightly move away from a convention. Now, art comes into play, and this we tried. Uh, the other kind of beautiful part of this project, which is also a, a continuous learning experience, is that can we use art to begin to address some of the issues of aging, like uh, you know, low vision, right? the meeting of wall and, and floor, or uh, memory boxing. right? I don't remember which, all the floors look the same. I don't know where I am. Well, if one floor is blue and one floor is orange, right? Maybe one can remember clearer, but can we even use that further to capture some of uh, the stories uh, and the symbols uh, that come with this community? Whether it's uh, you know icons of Baltimore, uh, Billy Holiday, for example, whose mother was a domestic worker, or other symbols of of support and and love and. And so you see a model that kind of begins to, to show how each floor is designed separately as a kind of its own story, its own color, its own palette. And then to bring all that also into the, to the kind of exterior view uh, with the kind of a, a artwork by Marissa, which is a perforated set of, of, of drawings on, on metal sheets. Uh, so bringing some of that feel and actually from an urban point of view, lighting up that corner in a neighborhood which is still somewhat sketchy. Yeah. So showing this as, you know, we kind of, I wish this was easier to do, and we've been working on it for four years, but starting to build finally. Uh, but, but really an aspiration to, to be able to find the right people. And I feel this in general more and more in, in architecture that uh, alone, uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to really get something significant done. And uh, we, we need to find the right partners, the right uh, collaborators as well, to, to make something uh, impactful. I think with that, uh, I ran through a lot, but thank you. Good on time? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think I did pretty good. Time, no? Um, okay. I'm thinking also of a question. I'm, I'm also thinking of a question. <laughs> Retrospective, I, I went to North Carolina State University 100 years ago, and Svee Fector, Beck, Svee Hecker. Hecker was someone that we learned about oh. but at the very beginning of his career. Mm -hmm. but I, what I, you know, and that was a school that was inspired very much by Frank Lloyd Wright. But mm -hmm. what was interesting about Hecker was the, the use of geometry, this kind of persists the housing projects, which yeah. you, sh you showed us sort of a glimpse. Um, but I'm, I'm intrigued by the way that you... Uh, you've internalized this kind of geometric mm. structure in a way mm. that um, that I can see in the buildings, but it's it's used it, somehow. It it flows more. Situations are different. Maybe mm. the need for a, a crystal geometry, a kind of crystalline geometry, mm. is not quite the same. But I think, for instance, on the museum, um, the way in which those spaces link together and how the landscape kind of morphs into the building. I think that's, that's been, uh, it's beautifully sort of carried through. Mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting, for me, it's just interesting to connect your work, which she had mentioned to me that yeah. you had worked as Hecker, but it went right out of my mind and now it's, now it's back. So yeah. um, I think that's uh, very interesting. I also want to say I applaud the continuous weaving 
architectural discipline and tradition through the work, through very non-traditional work, but that is underpinned by this uh, mm -hmm. relationship to Hecker and Neumann and all the way back, August Perret even. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's um, something that is, well, at least in my opinion, being lost a little bit mm. in, uh, in how one generation is connecting to the next these days. And so yeah. for me, uh, that this, this lecture is a superb role model um, oh, thank you. for how one incorporates this thing and then comes up and then is able to produce something that's very much your own. Mm. The first project was incredible, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I want to live there. Anyway, uh, that's not a good question. But, um, maybe no, we that's, can talk a bit no go on, tradition. go on. No, that's no. <laughs> <laughs> great. Mm -hmm. Is this being recorded? Yes. Okay. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I also thought it was an extremely interesting lecture in the way you tried to bring architectural thinking into all these different situations in a, in a I think, really quite brave way in many ways. Um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about... Um, how architecture or architectural thinking relates to this question of what's often called the informal city, which you've no doubt encountered. Um, I think some people have the feeling that any architectural intervention is in a sense an illegitimate imposition. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you clearly have direct experience in these situations. What are your thoughts on that? Right. Wow. It's. Um... <clears throat> Okay, two, there are two parts here. There's the informal, right, the informal city, and the, uh, which is one thing we can talk about. And then the idea that an architectural intervention is a kind of a disruption. Um, you know, human existence is a disruption, but I don't think that uh, <laughs> this is part, really I believe that um, the idea that we shape our spaces is like essential to, to our existence. Um, we're going to do it either way. Uh, I don't think informal, uh, informal settlements, informal barrios or favelas or whatever, I don't think they're an architectural problem. There's a social, political, economic problem. I don't think it's an architectural problem. Not, not a space for architecture. In, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I actually, I had a, a big argument with Richard Sennett about this. And he said this is, a, he came to the GSD to talk about how architects need to know. It's not an architectural problem. It's not what we're trying to do. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we can draw many, many parallels, but uh, I think we invest a lot in a skill set to elevate the work that we do to a point of uh, inspiration. We're not here to solve all the buildings in the world, but we're here to inspire people to see the landscape and see the potential of the spaces that we shape because we're a very small <laughs> group, right? Yeah. So this is where I think we need to invest our, it doesn't mean that we are not, we shouldn't be aware of social issues, et cetera. But I would not, I, I, I refuse so many times to do a studio around kind of informal yeah. settlements or, you know, improving the lives because I don't, I don't believe in it. Thank you. I also loved the first project and oh. would be happy to live there if, if that's an option. Um, so. I get Robert got in the line first, but um, what what I found really interesting about the mm -hmm. Care House project is that it seems to come towards the tail end of the kind of century long baby boomer um, mm -hmm. kind of project arc, where if in the 1940s there was a, a kind of program of school building or house building, and now we're like 80 years into that and thinking yeah. about what happens as people age, right. and so it's quite interesting to think about the entanglement of millennials or Gen X people working in this way. And I wonder if you have th sort of thought about what are the future generational spatial questions that will come about you know, after probably 2050 as uh, the baby boomers are no longer mm -hmm. uh, around. Yeah, 
I mean, uh, it's, it's a super, it's a great question. I mean, this is one, one of the themes that we're constantly discussing among ourselves in, in this care house group and in the office. And we decided that actually the strategy is to do all we can to get one built as a pilot, you know, at least one, and, and, and see what the issues are. Because you really need to, you can't always theorize about it. Even if we have an idea, who knows if it will work, you know. There's so many factors and, and variables here. Uh, and it's, you know, we're talking with peop about people, you know. And so the, the approach is we're going to build one, two, three as much as we can and get the funding for it and test it out and see what, what and we already learned many things, yeah, but even just in the process. Test it out and see what is the scale, what's the, what's the size, what are the clustering, what are the relationships that, that happen. You're, you're absolutely right that there is a bigger generational shift. It's not only, well, we could say it's kind of whether it's modernism or not, but it's also about the state being once involved and less involved, right? The 20th century produced these ideas that, okay, you work here, you live there, but also all the kids go here. All the old people go there, right? This is what, it, and then let's build three-bedroom apartments. <laughs> I mean, when I say let's, it's not only, and it's not in the U.S., it's like half the other world as well, you know. States build housing, right? So, uh, and in an era that, and, you know, we, they still exist, right? But in an era that someone else, or let's say uh, governments in a way, the nation state decided for us how we should live, right? And that's collapsing, obviously. So who, who, is, uh, who is in charge now? Is it, do we leave it to private people, right? Part of the idea of the collective is, right, to explore or identify the, the reemergence of a group as an entity that has the power to kind of shape its own, right? So there are a lot, there are a lot of things that are happening now, and actually, you know, digital platforms make it even easier, could make it easier. So I think there's a lot, a lot to explore there. Uh, so, I mean, this is, you know, your project, but for there's someone there that's, yeah. <laughs> I, I can come over there, you know. Um, yeah, I have a question about, I think you said we're on the island of Andros, like sort of mm -hmm. vertically localized. And um, I'll preface this with, I'm an artist, and I'm Jewish, and spend a lot of time in this side of the island. And I was kind of curious to hear from an architect's point of view, I've watched throughout my life the island see immense development. And uh, there's nothing wrong with development. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I've been going to Andros uh, since 2008, almost. Construction is just two years. Uh, so we've been going there. Uh, and the people of, of that, that are living in those houses have been going there as well yeah. for years and years. Uh, Andros itself, this village is active all year round. Um, it's it's uh, actually Andros is less built on on tourism, um, and uh, you know if you uh, first two things, if you ever try to build in the Cycladic Islands, uh, you know that permitting is like 
you cannot believe how strict things are. You know, you have a limit to a size of a window. You know, every window they say. So there's, it's incredible how much, and this is rooted in the culture, how much respect there is for the landscape. And uh, what we had to go through also, and, and I love that, of course, you know, of, of these limitations and preserving the landscape and keeping the landscape uh, and so forth. Um, so that's, that's kind of one thing. And then the other thing is the way that the landscape, these terraces, once you have the walls, and they already human intervened. And it's really interesting in, in, in the Greek kind of code of thought, there is wilderness and then there is human made. Wilderness, it, you, would, you would think, like in this country, oh, you see an empty field. Oh, I can build on it, empty, nothing there. No. If, if humans weren't there before, you can't touch it. Even if it's completely empty and you know, there's nothing there, just weeds, doesn't matter. But where humans were, they see that as part of a fabric where landscape and building are not separate. And it, this goes way back, if you think of the Greek temples, or, you know, the Greek compounds, and how Greeks saw their in, intervention in the, you know, the cosmos is that landscape and building are not separate elements. They always talk to each other. And this is the same with humans and, and wildlife, right? It's the same idea with humans and the gods. It's, it's a constant conversation. So I don't, I don't see that as an interference, in a way. And uh, it's not, you know, the houses are, there is a family that's living there most of the year. It's not, actually likes to come there in the winter. Uh, and it's a very active village, so it's not, it's not a tourist project in that sense at all. Uh, and the whole process, you know, um, being in the village, uh, we're not like taking away anything uh, uh, from, from village life, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, again, I think it kind of goes back to that question in a way, uh, or... Uh, this uh, and I, 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 I'm hearing it in other places. Maybe it's a bit of a long shot, but there is a resistance, uh, uh, somewhat, against building new buildings in general. And I, I find it really, uh, really disturbing because the, it's, it's like you would say, don't write any new songs. Well, maybe songs is fine. It doesn't hurt anyone, right? Don't make any new. Object, don't make anything new because we have enough. No, that's not how it works. Make something new that, if we want to talk about ecology or other, that, you know, has its own life cycle or whatever. We have other ways. We cannot, uh, we, we shouldn't be fighting our creative impulse, really, because that creative impulse allows us to do so many other things that are essential for our well-being in our existence. So we can't just say, okay, be creative here, but don't be creative here. Don't do any more architecture, but you know, you can still, you know, make new clothes. It's, it's okay to make new clothes. Maybe we shouldn't make any new clothes, right? But it's, it's, it's really, I mean, we, we are, we have the imagination and ability to change the discourse if we want to talk about ecology, if we want to talk about sustainability, but not on the account of killing our creative drive. Yes. It's, uh, I have another lecture just for that. <laughs> uh, with all the plans and the details and the colors, you know, like um, fixtures, it need to, need to stand out. So let's say uh, knobs or like where the toilet, you know, the toilet paper is. It has to be like a bright color. And there are all, obviously there are uh, ergonomics here about dimensions and spaces and but materials, you know, and how you transition between materials and what is slip, not slip, what you fall on. It's, you know, falling on, you know, concrete versus wood versus carpet, but carpet gets dirty, so woven nylon. So all, a whole set of issues of materials, access. 
This building, if you saw it or not, but the whole, there are no corridors in this building. There's just a common room, a common space that has one, one face, one glass wall to a terrace where all the light comes in. And from that single space, you enter the units. So for example, that, that idea, a building with no corridors, you enter the common room. But also it's for uh, the kind of you can still have and maintain a kind of privacy or non-privacy, depending on your, how you feel, right? Because you could leave your door half open, but it's still part of the common room, or close the door. So, and, and the, but it's part of something that we need to test out. But the idea is that the way we lay out and design space really impacts the way we, we, we live. I mean, impacts the, the kind of relationships that are established and what we can do in that space, right? But it's all, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're discovering this as we, as we kind of go along and really depends also on the population and, you know, who ends up living there. And I, I, you know, I can also talk about the diverse unit types. There's not a single kind of, there may be two or three repetitive units, but they're very different units. There are studios, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom. But really the big, the big uh, um, I would say, innovation of this building is that it creates apartments, units for caregivers. And usually we only think of the elders and we kind of not only, but we primarily think of the elders there that kind of, uh, they bring in, you know, they pay for their rent, but we don't think of the caregivers. And here we designed units for single parents, right? And, and the whole idea is to create a space that caregivers can live together because when you're one-on-one -on -one with an elder and they fall in the tub, you can't lift them alone, right? Or if you need to leave to get some medicine. So that way, if you have another caregiver in the same building, you know, so hey, g give me a hand, right? Or they have kids, so one watches over the kids as they, you know, come back from school, makes food, and, and then the others. Can. So there's a whole different dynamics that we're trying to create, which was natural to how many societies lived for centuries but we kind of lost it. Yeah. Good? Yeah.